Hello, everybody, and welcome back to day two of The Truth About Vaccines 2020 Vaccine Roundtable. There's Ty and Charlene Bollinger. We're your hosts, and we've got Dr. Judy Mikovits. Hello, Judy, and Dr. Andy Wakefield. Hi, Andy. We've got Del Big Tree, he's in the house, and the one and only Bobby Kennedy. We love you. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Sherry Tinpenny. Hello, Sherry. And Ty's very favorite, Dr. Dr. Buttar. Dr. Buttar. There you go. Because I know, I know you love everybody, Ty, but is it the doc, your faith? Uh, you know, it's funny. Dr. Buttar and I have had this thing going for like a decade now that in public we'll never admit if, that we like each other at all. It's, it's quite the opposite. But it's interesting. It was, what was it, Rashid? Uh, 2017? In Orlando. Oh yeah, when you were hugging me and you were whispering something in my ear, and somebody said, yeah, "You guys never." Um, well, they you got know, it on film that I actually, I actually do love Rasha. And he's a somebody said, "Somebody said uh, you guys have a love-hate relationship going," and I said, "No, no, it's a hate-hate relationship." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Doc loves me, honey. I'm his favorite. So yeah, that's absolutely, just, without know, a doubt. That's what it is. That's <laughs> what it is. So you know, let's get this party started. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank um, you, everybody that's watching. This is part two of our expert, expert roundtable. We hope you enjoyed yesterday. And we got a lot more uh, interesting topics to cover. We really, we had like about 15 topics here. Yeah. We hit maybe three of them yesterday. Well, so we've yeah. got more, but that's okay. It's just, you know, we're, gonna, we're just going to take it as it comes here. Yeah. The, the, the thing is yesterday, a lot of what we had written down because we wanted to cover, we have a story to tell, we all do. And we're trying to get it organized to help our viewer understand the, the critical um, issue of vaccines, forced vaccine censorship and so forth. And so... Um, we just wanted to start out today after that amazing discussion we had yesterday with uh, Healthy People 2020 um, and the, the, the forced vax. Now, do you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, let me, let me get this first. This is what I wanted to kind of follow over from yesterday. Okay, because this, this point, I just wanted to dig in a little bit and go there, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead then. Yeah, with the Healthy People 2020, we were saying yesterday, the reason that we did this year, and we've done the truth about cancer, a global quest. We've done Eastern medicine, going to Asia to, to bring back to you um, all of the amazing therapies being used by medical doctors around the world to uh, heal the body, not only of cancer, but many diseases. And we've also covered the truth about vaccines. But this year, Ty and I talked and we prayed about it. And we just felt like healthy people 2020 was a big deal. The year 2020 was a big deal. That's why we put the truth about vaccines 2020, because we felt like we are under such pressure and they're really, they've been pushing for this forced vaccine for, for many years. But this year we felt like this is the year that if, if we don't help people understand this critical issue, we may lose our freedoms and they may be able to come in and try, I can say try, they will not force us, but try to force us into these vaccines. But we did not know what we were getting into, God did. He knew that the COVID-19 thing was going to happen. The pandemic was going to be crazy. And the, the lockdown um, quarantine, it's, it's backwards. Like Rashid said yesterday about the mask. There, there's a reason you wear the mask. It's to protect the people on the outside. But now we're all being forced, which we're not. But they're trying to force us all to wear a mask. Uh, they're, instead of locking in the, the sick people into their well, they're locking in the well people. So we're dealing with a lot of uh, different things. You know, I was watching uh, Tucker Carlson because he, he, he's actually had Bobby Kennedy on and we were all so excited. Bobby, when you got on Tucker Carlson telling the truth about vaccines, we were screaming. I think Ty and I were somewhere speaking. I don't remember. We were in but Canada. Yeah, I remember we were in a hotel room and we literally like we left the, the parties that were happening and we tuned in because we wanted to see you live on Tucker and you told the truth and we couldn't believe that a mainstream media outlet was covering that. So we felt like the Tucker's our friend. Oh, good. This is great. Well, last night, I don't know if anybody was, was tuned into this, but on Tucker Carlson live and he's covering some pretty good things. He's got a uh, good guest that, that they're for the Liberty and constitution for the people, but he said something and I actually put it on our, our personal Facebook, just, um, why didn't Tucker Carlson dig into this? He, he had a guest and they talked about Operation Warp Speed of the COVID vaccination where they're, they're literally gonna pass through the, the trials that they should be doing. They're gonna skip all of that safety uh, measures to get to this vaccine. They're gonna have 100 million ready to go. So if it's good, they've got it ready to roll out, which is such a massive 
uh, concern of ours. And, and so the, 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 the guest talked about this as if it were a good thing. And Tucker Carlson, who has interviewed our good friend, Bobby Kennedy, and he shared the truth about vaccines. Now that was a couple of years ago when that happened, granted, I don't know if it's his sponsors or if he can no longer dig into that issue, but he didn't. And I was, I was really let down by the fact that Tucker Carlson allowed that guest to say that and didn't dig in because he's so good at digging into those things. So I see you, Judy, raising your hand. Um, what, what did you want to say about that? I, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say something about it. Yeah. There's now 80 vaccines, 80 separate vaccine projects. Um, Bill Gates um, has eight of them. Bill Gates is now the biggest vaccine producer in the world, bigger than any other company. Um, but one of Gates's vaccines is the Moderna vaccine, which is the first one out of the gate. And the Moderna vaccine is a really dangerous human experiment. It's shockingly reckless, and particularly to go forward without any kind of animal tests at all. They're, they went to, right to phase one human trials. It, the reason it's a, it was preferable, and, and by the way, Tony Fauci has arranged for that company, Moderna, which has never produced a vaccine, has never produced any project, which was on the verge of bankruptcy. It was $1.5 billion in debt. It lost $500 million last year alone. It was gonna go bankrupt. And Gates, who has been funding it, and Fauci rescued the company from bankruptcy by giving them the first of these projects. The project is an RNA vaccine, which has never been made before. And the, what an RNA vaccine does, unlike most vaccines in which you're injected with an, with an antigen, which is a, a piece of the target virus, a disabled piece, and an adjuvant, which increases, shocks the body to increase the immune response. That's how every other vaccine works. This is an experimental technology that has never been done before in history. And what it does is it injects a snippet of the virus that, is, that carries a genetic code in its RNA that is designed to alter the DNA, the code in, your, in every cell in your body to get your body to start naturally producing those antigens. It is a form of genetic engineering. It's not a form, it is genetic engineering. It has been condemned by the Geneva Statement because those genetic changes will survive in your sperm and they will live in your children or in your ovaries. So they are injecting human beings with an untested um, genetic gene altering technology designed to change the human genome and without having any proof that it actually works. I want to say one other thing. There's a problem with COVID vaccines that requires that they have to be tested. And that problem is called um, paradoxical immune enhancement. And what that means is, and here's what happened. After the SARS epidemic in 2002, there were three SARS epidemic. The first one was a natural one that began in China, and there were two that were lap escapees. And that's not controversial. People know that, acknowledge that. After those epidemics, the Chinese and the Western nations all got together and they said, we've got to develop a vaccine to treat coronavirus, which SARS was kind of coronavirus. They got together, they developed about 30 different vaccines and they chose the four most promising models. They tested them on ferrets, which are the, uh, the animal that is most analogous to the human reaction to upper respiratory infections. They're very similar to humans. They're very predictive of what's gonna happen in human beings. The ferrets developed in every one of them for all four vaccines an admirable immune response. So the scientists thought they'd hit the jackpot because that, that's how, that is the metric upon which FDA bases vaccine approval. Vaccines are never tested in the field. 
if the FDA never gives 2,000 people a vaccine and 2,000 people placebo and says, go out in the world and see what happens, that never happens. The way the vaccines get a license is the, F, the, the uh, promoter of the vaccine, the company, injects a couple thousand people with the vaccine and then they test their blood to see if they developed an antibody response. Well, the ferrets developed a perfect picture perfect antibody response. So they all thought they hit the jackpot, but then something horrible happened. When those ferrets were, at, were later exposed to the wild virus, they all had body-wide inflammation in all of their organs and they died. The scientists then remembered something. They remembered that in the 1960s, the FDA and the NIH had tested an RSV vaccine, which is very similar to coronavirus, upper respiratory vaccine. They had skipped animal studies and they had gone right to humans and they had tested on about 35 human being kids. And the kids again developed a, a sterling antibody response. So they thought again, they hit the jackpot. But when those children were exposed to the wild virus, instead of protecting them against it, the vaccine actually enhanced the, the pathways of the virus. And the two of those kids died, they all became horrendously sick. It became a scandal and they dropped it and never touched it again. But they realized when they, the same happened with that ferret, those ferrets, and that coronavirus does something interesting when it, when it provokes the antibody response. There's two kinds of antibodies. There are neutralizing antibodies, which are the kind that defend you from disease. But there's another kind of antibody that is binding, called a binding antibody, and it actually helps the virus stick to your receptors, and it makes it much, much more dangerous. And that's the kind that has, is produced by coronavirus vaccines. That was in 2012, and they completely terminated the program. But then in 2014, Tony Fauci had developed a dengue vaccine, and in the clinical trials for the dengue vaccine, they saw some of the same signals, that actually the people who got the vaccine and then later were exposed got very sick. But they glossed over that, and they gave it to the Philippines. The Philippines gave it to 100,000 kids, and many, many of those kids, when they finally encountered the wild and gave virus, became horrendously sick and 600 of them died. And the Philippine government today is criminally prosecuting the Philippine public health officials who waved that vaccine through because they should have known that Fauci's and the clinical trials had, had seen these signals previously. So today, the people who have been fighting, all the people on this panel, the Sherry and Andy and Dell and Judy and me, the, the, the people who have been our loudest critics, Peter Hotes, Paul Offit, Ian Lipkin, all of them are vaccine developers. All of them are bullhorns for the vaccine industry. All of them are mercenaries, the, 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 the generals in the mercenary army that has been fighting us for years. And all of them are saying it is insanely dangerous. Or Tony Fauci to go ahead with these trials to inject human beings. He started on March 12th, injecting human beings in Seattle, Washington, volunteers who I'm sure had no idea that their genes were being permanently altered for generations. There's no informed consent because I guarantee you Tony Fauci didn't tell them that. And he's testing his vaccine that he put almost half a billion dollars into, authorized our taxpayer fund going into that, which gives him control of the patent, of half the patent. And Bill Gates' vaccine to fast track this very, very dangerous vaccine without animal studies is reckless and I would say is criminal. And I would like to add to that, Bobby, that's amazing. And I did, during the period of time that they were doing those dengue vaccine trials, I was following that pretty closely. But, you know, the thing that's the scary, that's even more scary than what you said, and I'm going to just throw this out here to start with, and you, from your legal perspective, I'd like you to add to this, is we are now operating underneath the PREP Act. 
You know, the PREP Act is a 2005 piece of legislation that stands for Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act that was tacked on to the, to the tail end of a de defense appropriation bill at 1120 at night on, a fr on Friday night, December 17th, after everybody in the House had already signed off and gone home. The Senate never read it. They passed it. Even your uncle, even your uncle, Ted Kennedy, or, or, you know, or, uh, uh, said afterwards, um, you know, we, we judge how well the pharmaceutical company usually wins around here, and they usually get big wins, but no, they've never gotten a win this big. And, and that was part of the ledger. And you can't find any of those documents now. The, the, uh, I wrote of the, my book, Fowl, in real time about the bird flu. And, I, and all of that is in my book. And I've captured that. And if you try to go find that stuff on the internet now, you can find about the PREP Act. All of it's been scrubbed. Because what does the PREP Act actually do? It gives complete liability immunity for any count, covered countermeasure that's made while it's in place. You can't sue them. You can't, they're liable for, their products have complete liability. You can't sue them. The only way that you can sue, sue them if a bunch of people get injured or killed is that you have to go to the U.S. Attorney General and prove willful misconduct that they were intentionally going to create a product intentionally to harm you or kill you. And it's like, good luck with that. Well, guess what? Alex, Alex Azar, our great HHS secretary, instituted the PREP Act on February, on, February the, well, on February the 4th, he put it in there and he put it into the Federal Register on March the 17th. So we are operating under that now. So I'd like you, like you to expand on that more. I mean, that's what I know about it, what I've read about it, and where we are operating now. I mean, what else can you let the American people know about this PREP Act? Bill Gates said from the beginning he was not going to allow any of his vaccines to be used unless he got full immunity from all the governments in all the countries that he used his vaccine. Because he knows he's going to, he's going to kill a lot of people. And, you know, he himself said, look, this vaccine is only going to be tested at most maybe a thousand people. What if there's an injury rate of one in 10,000? You won't see that if you test a thousand people. You will never see it. But a, an injury rate of one in 10,000, if you give that, let's say it's a death rate of one in 10,000, very, very possible, if you, and you'll never see it. If you give that vaccine to 7 billion people, which is what he's intending, I mean, 700,000 people are gonna die from it. You know, and, and you get, you know, ultimately you'll get to a, um, a level where with the other injuries, et cetera, that you're causing, you know, it, it, you're causing more problems than you're averting. It's very, very possible. If you're only testing that vaccine, if you don't test it on animals, you go right to humans and you test a thousand humans, plus there's no placebo. But they don't care because they're under the PREP Act. So they have complete blanket immunity from liability. They can end up killing every person they give this to in Seattle. What do they care? They, they, you know, it's a gamble for them. Because if that, that Moderna vaccine works, Gates is going to make a billion dollars. And if it doesn't work, he's got eight other in the pipeline. They'll just say, oh, that was a bad experiment. The reason they're going forward so quickly with that is because you don't, there's no biological material. You don't have to manufacture anything. With other vaccines, you have to start a factory and you have to grow the, you know, the, the vaccine, the mold and the Petri dishes, the virus and the Petri dishes, and you have to switch it from animal to animal to animal. And, and you have to then treat it, you have to add the adjuvant, and it's a, it's a long process. But with the Moderna vaccine, your body becomes the factory because you're altering the human DNA so that it will produce the antibody. And, um, and so they don't have to build any factory. They just take little snippets of the RNA and inject them into human beings and let you do all the work. So they can fast track it overnight. They can literally get it to market within months. And that's what they did within weeks. They, all they needed was that genetic code from the Chinese and they can make this RNA virus. And it is extraordinary. It's never been used. It's never been proven in any model. And the company that's making it has never brought a product to market. They've never been through phase three trials. Uh, and they were on the edge of bankruptcy. Oh, uh, it is really, really, really crazy. 
And it what could possibly go wrong? What, yeah, what, could, possibly, what could possibly go wrong? To you show know, the and, and how willing they are to play God, which is that's it. The history of vaccinology. And Gates has this megalomaniacal, you know, Messiah uh, complex where he believes that he is up there and can experiment with lesser human beings and, um, and you know, and if there's collateral damage, then so be it. He's well-intentioned and he's going to save the world. And, you know, those poor suckers who took this, you know, who are heroes because they volunteered for a program, but it's like, people volunteering in war for irresponsible generals who don't care what they do to their people and don't value them. And that, you know, they, they got hoodwinked. One of the My, things, Bobby, is when you end up putting RNA, introduce it into the body, <clears throat> the implications aren't something that necessarily will be seen in a week or a month, or, you know, it could be a year or two years. And then the generational component, because now it's actually changing the genetic code and it's going to be something that's going to stay consistent and continue to propagate generation to generation. Am I, am I right, Judy? Yes. Yes. So much so by the way, on one of the studies we're looking at, I believe is the Moderna study. They are forbidding sexual intercourse without full protection, meaning they are so concerned there can be no pregnancy allowed by anybody involved in this study, meaning they are so concerned that they may have a generational problem that they want to keep make, you know, that this study group is in its, you know, in its application, it's stating that they can't have to, you know, that they can't, you know, be working on a child, however you want to put that. I think one of my, my biggest concerns when I talk about this is that, you know, and I think Bobby, you put it perfectly, I believe this is the God vaccine. We're talking about no longer letting the body, you know, react to an antigen or something. We're talking about messaging RNA. We're talking about, you know, putting in man-made messages that go to all of your cells to make the cell think it's getting information from the DNA. I mean, we're playing and we're spelunking a place in the immune system we've never gone before. But here's my biggest concern. We do know that they are all focused on this antibody immune enhancement issue that you very well described. The animals all died in the trials and now we're going on to human beings. Now, this is what Hotez sat before our Congress and talked about. Even Tony Fauci said on television, there is a concern that this vaccine could make people more sick. We don't want to do that. But the most troubling thing about it that most people don't understand is how little these virologists know about how a vaccine works. And even more so, what Dr. Peter Hotez said, we don't know why antibody immune enhancement happens. We don't know what's causing it. So my concern is that in these small test groups that they're doing, you know, you're looking at those people as, you know, and I agree, they might as well have just signed up to go to Mars for the first time. You know, my hat's off to them. I mean, well done. You're doing something that's, you know, going a place where no one's gone before. I don't know if they know what risk they've taken, but what happens? Let's say they get around it. One of these vaccines gets to one of these small trials, and for some reason, antibody immune doesn't, enhancement doesn't happen. Whatever virus they're working with, whatever mutation. But what I want to say is that throughout the time, since the beginning of mankind, there's never been a bacteria or a virus outbreak that that took out the species you know there's something about nature and our relationship to it that we survive we even get stronger as we go along but we are talking about a vaccine that's being discussed by world leaders being driven by bill gates saying everyone in the world is going to get this vaccine can you imagine a vaccine that gets to the trials looks like it's safe they somehow they get away i don't think it's going to happen but let's go with the what their scenario is their dream is to vaccinate everyone in the world. And then all of a sudden, maybe the, the, the strain that they designed the vaccine around avoided that problem, but all of a sudden there's a mutation and then it starts triggering, it gets out and starts triggering antibody immune enhancement. Now all of a sudden we're not watching 0.1% of people die, 0.3% or 10%. You could talk about a scenario where 30% of those coming in contact with what would have been a cold, like those ferrets, their bodies are overreacting to this and they're having complete organ failure and shutdown. You could honestly be looking at a vaccine for the first time that has the potential to eradicate our species. That is how dangerous 
this vaccine is. And this is what I say every time I've been interviewed like crazy. I say of all the times we have ever put two of the most dangerous words together known to man, rushed and science in the same sentence is the most dangerous statement that could ever be made. And we are allowing that statement to be made on one of the most dangerous approaches to vaccines there has ever been. This is the message that everyone really needs to share with everyone they know. This is not a joke. And you know, though I care for the 45 people in each one of these studies right now, or the thousands that may go on to an efficacy study, this thing is coming for us. And I can't imagine anything more ridiculous than a life-threatening vaccine that has an issue that they don't even understand why it happens for an illness that kills 0.1 to 0.3% of the world. Let me, let me add one thing to, to what you said, to what I was saying. The CNN did a, did a really interesting article um, that appeared this morning about Moderna. And they, at the very end, it was a very, very long article. And you know, with most of those articles, only like 1% or, or 0.01% of people ever get to the end. But in the last couple paragraphs, they interviewed two of the former officials, people who had worked at Moderna until uh, to like 2018. And one of them was, I think, the COO of the company. And he said, um, I was shocked when I read that the federal government had gave them, had given that company $438 million. I was shocked. The other guy, and he said, I don't know what they were thinking of. That's what he said. This is the guy who worked at the company. The other guy was at their chief chemist. He was the head of all of their chemistry department. His name's Dr. Suhak Siddiqui. And he said, there is nothing that could make me put that vaccine in my body. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dale, you're absolutely right. You know, the, do you remember that extraordinary interview by Peter Arby? What? Yeah, Peter Arby I've known for many years. A very, very good vaccinologist works for a vaccine maker, the Start and Serum Institute. And, and he's worked in West Africa for the most of his professional life. And he said in that interview, we think we know what our vaccines are doing. We don't. I mean, that's an extraordinary, he's a very, very honest man. And he went up against the system and, and then demonstrated clearly in the non, looking at the non-specific effects of vaccines, the DTP vaccine had killed more children in West Africa than it had saved from the target diseases, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. And that is the most widely used vaccine historically in the world. That's Gates vaccine. It's an astonishing admission, and it was completely ignored. I think the only yeah. response of the authorities was to remove his funding. Um, but we really live in an era where we know so little, and we assume so much. It same happened with pertussis. I remember that Salzburg wrote an article blaming anti-vaxxers for the outbreaks of whooping cough, and then there was an admission by Christopher Gill from Boston University saying uh, that um, we've made assumptions upon assumptions. We didn't understand how pertussis interacted with the human immune system. We're in the embarrassing position of having to admit that we may have made some serious mistakes. That's the truth. Yeah. It's not the anti-vaxxers. It's the hubris that someone pointed out of the pharmaceutical industry and the vaccinologists, the idea that you can exert dominion, you can mutate, you can adapt, you can change these things, you can give them back by a different route, age, strain, and you can um, assume dominion over the organisms and, and that they, you will de beat them, you will, you, are, you will master them. No, you won't. You will not do that uh, for the very reason amongst others, is that they mutate at such an extraordinary rate because they are destined to survive. They will survive. And so um, it is, It is. we face a sixth extinction, a sixth major extinction, and it's the only one in the history, the geological history of this planet that's been man-made. And it's the only one, actually, that we can avert, and I believe that we will avert. Andy, years ago at a conference, I think it was at, w at one of the NVIC conferences, you said the human race has evolved because of its relationship with microbes, not in spite of it. And that has resonated with me, and I've used that a lot, and I've always given you credit. 
that you've said that over and over way, so many years ago because it's so true. We look at, you know, one of these days, maybe this is like what Del, what you were saying that, and I agree with you, that suddenly we've got people vaccine, manda- you're going to vaccinate me, mandatory vaccination is right here in people's faces that never even, first of all, never even heard of it. And second of all, never gave it any thought. And perhaps this is going to give some clarity and some, some eye opening to the whole concept of the germ theory too. You know, that it's really about the terrain and me and, and vaccinating me doesn't keep you from getting sick. And so maybe there will even be some changes in that. And now, especially now with all the research out there about the microbiome and all the different types of microbiome and our, you know, even talking about a brain microbiome now, you know, and stuff. So, you know, maybe that, maybe this will be another one of those lemons that will be made into lemonade that people will start to understand our relationship with microbes. And it's not all bad. It's not all bad. There's only I one part of this. Telling that story now. You go ahead. Go ahead. What's that? Go ahead, Andy. Jump in there. Jump in there. No, and I, I, I was merely going to agree and say that I think that the people who have been telling that story, um, from whatever part of the, of the spectrum of biology they come from, or medicine, or, or, or public service, it, it, those who have been telling that story as the truth emerges are the ones that, in the future, are, go, are going to be trusted by the people. Uh, as someone said earlier, I think it was Bobby, that people have, on this this group of people here have been predicting the outcomes. Dell mentioned it as well, have been saying, look, this is what's going on. This isn't conspiracy theory. This is, this is going to happen. This, this, you know, mandatory vaccination, chipping, all these things. That has come to pass. That has come to pass. In other words, the people on this side of the equation were right. Um, and I think those are the people in the future who should be trusted. The, the thing is that, you know, what everybody is talking about, I think the most crucial component is that, and it's been said, we all saw it coming, but it's now being censored. So this conspiracy is no longer a conspiracy, or it's not a theory, I should say. We all know that the CIA came up with that term in order to stop people asking the questions. And that's the question we should be asking, why is this being censored? In fact, it was after, uh, from what I understand from reading history, it was after your uncle was assassinated, Bobby, that the term conspiracy theory was, was coined to throw people off from asking those key questions. And I think one of the questions we should be asking, rather than where it came from, whether it was China or not, I think we should be asking why is information regarding this and a certain type of technology being censored? Because that in itself sheds light on what's going on. And we know that there's a, I know probably most of the panel may not want to even talk about this, but you know, you've got you've got a car that has four wheels and you got a steering wheel, but without any of those wheels, a car is not going to be able to move. And so here there's something else that's going on because viruses don't act uh, creating a hypoxic type altitude sickness type of scenario. And when they bypass all the normal standard processes of stabilizing an airway and when you ignore continuous positive airway pressure or or bilateral positive airway pressure, and you go straight into an invasive methodology of uh, endotracheal intubation. And now you've got things such as barotrauma and mechanical ventilation issues and aspiration issues and all sorts of other things that can happen. You know, you're you're bypassing the normal process because a lot of doctors don't know how to deal with this. And of course, it's a confusing thing because it's not like a virus normally presents itself. But now the political aspects and, and nurses coming out saying that people are being murdered, their, their respiratory therapists aren't being allowed to respond to codes. Doctors that come out and speak about this are being removed from those, those places. Their videos are being censored. All sorts of different censorship is going on. That is really now what comes back to what Dell you were saying, where our fundamental rights are being questioned. And, and is this how you cook a frog, right? You don't throw, them into, throw a frog into boiling water. You slowly turn up the heat. And the heat in this particular case, the greatest blessing that we have, as you mentioned, Dell is that it, us being the frogs, we were actually thrown into boiling water. So it, it is something that is bringing it to a head. And I see this as a great opportunity, not just for this cause, but for all cause, because this is an evolutionary process now I think we're going to go through as human beings. And it's up to us to rise to that occasion. The question to me, it's the most important question, is why is information being censored? And if there's going to be a, a, a civil war in the United States, which I said 20 years ago, if it was going to be one, it would be over the issue of vaccinations. I think now the censorship and vaccination aspect is coming hand in hand. Things are being suppressed. And I think that's a place where we should ask the conversation to start with 
the general public that still may not be ready to digest our information is why is this information being censored? Just ask yourself that question, why? That's how I started these videos that I put out that just you know, went viral and got millions of views within two or three days. And then YouTube started shutting them down and, uh, and Facebook started shutting them down. So the question is why? Why is it being censored? What are you I, trying to hide? I just may say, I'll mention on the very briefly, Dell, Dell gave an outstanding interview in a, in a new movie on this issue of censorship. And it's something that's really perplexed us in terms of releasing the movie. And, We've, we've what, what we plan to do, and this is, has practical value in responding to the question you just asked, that as all these traditional platforms are disappearing for the kind of story we're telling, even those two doctors from mainstream medicine in Southern California talking about the facts of COVID the other day now censored, you know, extraordinary level of censorship, um, is that we are going out on a new platform, a censorship free platform, Sphere, S-P-H-I-R dot I-O, which provides a specific platform for this very conversation, for this very community, this growing community. And I would strongly commend to people that we, we focus upon a platform such as this to regroup, to bring all of this information and to have a censorship free environment in which people can disseminate this kind of information. So I just make a, a plea to, for people a plug for that. Um, sphere.io, a censorship-free blockchain encrypted platform that will, um, by virtue of the censorship on all other mainstream platforms of these issues, uh, be a place for it to go in the future. It won't be alone. There will be others, but it's certainly a start. You know, um, Andy and, and uh, to everyone on the panel, we've uh, specifically, all of us and others like us, talking about vaccines and real cancer therapies and therapies for diabetes, et cetera, uh, are being censored because if you look at the, the biggest lobby, and Bobby, you could probably tell us, the biggest lobby in DC is not oil, it's actually the pharmaceutical companies. They spend more money uh, buying off our lawmakers, our politicians, than any other lobby in DC, and that's problematic. And when you see uh, the mainstream media spoon feeding our, uh, us, all of us, the, the talking points, and then while we are releasing the truth about vaccines, the, the, the notice we've gotten and the response is outstanding and incredible in spite of um, the, the censorship. I think that people are finding us and, and they're learning how to find us and we're learning how to find them outside of these platforms because personally with the truth about vaccines and the truth about cancer, they took us off of Pinterest completely because we told the truth about vaccines and we had a pretty big presence there. We have over a million, close to two million collectively on Facebook They've told us we cannot even um, run a sponsored ad to reach new people with the opportunity to learn the truth about vaccines because what we talk about does not marry into their uh, talking points that vaccines are indeed safe and effective, though there's not one study to prove that to be the case. And we've got Vimeo who has come out and said, I'm sorry if you have a vaccine um, friendly uh, or an anti-vax video content we're taking you off of our platform and then we've got MailChimp that we have friends that that just shut them down uh, for talking about the truth about vaccines and uh, we're being shadow banned on Twitter and our hashtag on Instagram hashtag the truth about vaccines now you can find that on Twitter you can find it on Facebook to their credit but Instagram and we know is owned by Facebook took our hashtag campaign down and I believe Dell and Andy they took vaxxed down as well so we're all having issues um, reaching the people of the world in the conventional ways that we have done. Google took us completely down off of their platform. People were, we had organic traffic, just people searching for the truth about cancer or the truth about vaccines, but specifically the truth about cancer. You cannot find our website now. You can find 20 different pages. You can click page two, page three, and so on. And you will see um, our world-class content on other people's websites because they haven't been hit like we've been hit, but you won't see the truth about cancer.com. And so this is a problem and we have been in prayer and uh, asking God to, to help us to reach the world. So the platform that Andy is talking about is critical. There's another platform that we have also been um, using. We, we are friends with the, the founders, in fact, um, and we'll talk about that in the days to come, but we have a little presence there and it's very small, but we have seen more people come in as viewers from that little tiny presence we have than Facebook and all of the other platforms. And we have a giant presence, as I said, millions on Facebook. 
So um, we're working night and day to find solutions and we bring the solutions to the people. And coming together like this as a panel is critical to fight fake news, to fight censorship. And um, so we're gonna continue to offer that. So stay tuned beyond this interview. We're gonna talk more about what those platforms are, won't we, Ty? Yeah, yeah, and you know, anytime that, that you know, everybody's kind of alluded to censorship or spoken directly about censorship, anytime that you're in a situation and people that are watching, just think about this. If you're discussing a topic that a contrary view is not allowed to be discussed, then there's a real problem. Perhaps you don't have any foundation to stand on. Maybe you're concerned that your position is so weak that you can't defend it in a public court of opinion. And that's exactly what's going on. That's why, you know, the, the COVID-19, the censorship that's going on there, but also the censorship that's been going on for, for years when it comes to vaccines, it's, 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 you know, kicked up another notch now. But anytime that you get in a scenario like that, it should, it should be warning bells go off, you know, red flags that you can't discuss this topic. Um, we have a, a variety of people represented on this panel. We have staunch Democrats, staunch Republicans, people in the middle. We have a variety of religious perspectives. Charlie and I are Christians, Dr. Buttar, who I'll never admit is a good friend of mine, he's a Muslim. We, I would be glad to sit down and talk to him about our differing opinions. And at the end of the day, we're probably still gonna disagree, but we're still gonna be friends. And we can still have that discussion because you shouldn't stop somebody from discussing something that you disagree with. And what they've done with vaccines is they've said, vaccines are safe and effective. That is the religious dogma of modern medicine. And if you disagree with it, we won't allow you to have a voice. And that's, that is a real problem. That is the main problem with vaccinology today. The people that are pushing vaccines is they will not have a discussion. Uh, Bobby, I know you've challenged many of them to debates. They won't take you up on it. Dell, I, I think you and Andy probably have too. I, maybe everyone on the panels challenged them to debates. I wouldn't be surprised. They won't debate it. And that's the real problem. Everyone here, if, if you're watching and you're new to the, the vaccine movement and the, the vaccine truth movement, all we want is to be able to have a discussion about it and come to the, to the truth. And all we want is to maintain our right to say, I don't wanna take that vaccine and my family doesn't and so we're not going to, the right to choose. That's really all we want. We don't wanna force anybody to do anything against their will. And that's the real problem that we face today with with the, the people that are pro-vaccine is they don't want to hear the other positions and they'll just shut you down and censor you. Well, and, wouldn't, and wouldn't it be I, interesting, uh, to, to, you know, the, the pro-vaccine people really, they, in my opinion, if they really believe what they're talking about and they really have faith in what they're doing and they trust their science, they're missing a great opportunity to put all of us on the stage together somewhere. Wouldn't Peter Hotez and Paul Offit just love to put the heel of their boot on the throat of Sherry Tenpenny and just crush her publicly in front of everybody and say, what you're saying is just totally nonsense? I mean, they're up front and center or any one of us on, on any one of us that's on this panel. Wouldn't they love to have the opportunity to publicly embarrass us and shame us because they're so right and we're so wrong. So it, it should speak volumes to people Sherry. who hear that, who, who know that they don't have anything to stand on. And actually in 2000, and I believe it was in 2006 or seven, I was in Verona, Italy. I was invited by the government of, uh, in, in Italy, the, um, the, it was the psychiatric and the neurological division of their equivalent of the National Institute of Health, whatever it is for Italy. And so I was one of the keynote speakers and I had the second to the last lecture as a keynote. And then the other person who I didn't know at the time, it was off it. And what happened during that, it was, it was beautiful actually, because he started showing some of my slides and half truth to the point that I didn't know who the city it was, but I got agitated. There were three doctors that had to come and hold me back. I mean, I was so livid and it was going to be a physical altercation. And some woman stood up in the audience and started speaking, like yelling in Italian and everybody there had headphones on because there was multiple languages that were being translated into. And I picked up mine and put them in and she's screaming and Offit had this look on his face like, you know, like she was yelling at me, but she was screaming at him. And bottom line was that 
one of the neurologists there had started using our protocol for their child who was 12 years old at the time. And after six months, had, the child had started to speak and no longer had to wear diapers. And she was cursing off it. And he didn't know what was being said. He just had a smile on his face till he put on the headphones. And I realized, because she basically was saying, you know, you, all sorts of curse words, because even the interpreters were going, you are one. And then he stops and he's like, can we say that? Because he didn't know because it, it was that much livid. And people started clapping. And then I realized that the truth will be known. My dad's always said the truth will be known. I had no idea that Offit wrote a book and dedicated a whole chapter to me. I still don't know who the idiot was at that point, but it's a whole chapter he wrote about me in the book. I've realized that they don't want the opportunity to debate us one-on-one -on -one because if they do, then they would show their own vulnerabilities. They would show the lack of their science. But the key point is that when they talk about the vaccines are the key, vaccines are the key, the part that, again, this cognitive dissonance component and this, this illogical aspect if you have been vaccinated, then why are you worried about those that haven't been vaccinated? You're already vaccinated. You're already protected. And to Bobby's comment, when he starts his lectures and saying, I'm pro-vaccine, I've always said, I am not anti-vaccine. I have never been anti-vaccine. I've always been anti-stupidity. And every aspect of the current human intervention using vaccinations is defying every aspect of human physiology. So the, the whole thing about, well, somebody said that they're pro-vaccine and they don't understand the argument. I've been attacked saying, I can't believe Dr. Bhattar, you after testifying, blah, 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 you're pro-vaccine. I'm like, where did that come from? It came from because I said, they just read part of it. What I had said was, if there was ever a vaccine, it's like a unicorn. If there was a unicorn, I would love to have one. I would love to have a vaccine that didn't have adjuvants, that didn't have immunosuppressives that was actually able to seroconvert at the time that it was given without any adverse effect. It's like, Dell, you remember when we had the conversation in, in Acapulco and we talked about this and we said, great concept, bad product, right? right? How many people would get on a plane and travel if you knew that one out of 32 of you would either die or have permanent neurological implications? And everybody says the same thing. I wouldn't fly. Well, well, why are we, you know, this is the same thing. We have legs. God gave us legs to walk. But because man came along and said, listen, I'm gonna, I don't want to walk from here to South Africa, Johannesburg. Let me develop some new technology. And so we decided to fly. Well, it's the same type of thing. Vaccines are designed the way our bodies work to create immunity. Great concept. You got me so far. But now you're going to start introducing things into the body under the pretense of public safety that's suppressing the immune system and giving additional things that are immunosuppressive and that are irritating the immune system at a time when the body can't even seroconvert, it defies all logic again. And this is the question of why are we doing this? I'm not against vaccinations. I think it's a great idea if you can make something that's not going to hurt a person, but to make something that's going to hurt a person more than the original disease that they're worried about, it's just madness. You know, I that's just, really go ahead. Great. Great explanation. I just wanted to bounce over to Bobby with that. I'm sorry, Dell. We want to hear from you too. But that is such a good point that we hear from a lot of our opponents. Uh, when we we even mention in the film that we produced, we 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 talk about, you know, there's two sides to the coin. Let's look at both of them. Let's not say anti or pro-vax. Let's let's look at the facts and then figure out what's best for humanity because we're all pro-kids, we're all pro-family, and we're all pro-life. So um, yeah, we get pegged when we, we say things like that. And I just wanted to say, um, Bobby, what would your statement on this be? I mean, you come out and say, I, I, I would be for uh, vaccines if, if you could show me that they're safe and effective. So I think that that's the way we feel. If we find a safe and effective vaccine, we're for it. But we, I don't think we found one time. Bobby? Muted. Bobby, you're muted. You're muted. If you can, uh, I was actually, I put it on mute. I, I occasionally took, turned the, um, the, uh, the film off because I, I didn't eat all day and I was eating lunch. I was, try, I was trying to eat lunch until Andy started talking about, um, about the uh, laudable pus. And then I thought, <laughs> and, uh, so now I'm good. But, and the mute is off. I agree with 100% what Rashid was saying, which is, um, I'm all for vaccines if they can make them safe and effective. I've never seen it happen before, but it's a great theory. But I always, you know, part of my job is to try to bring in people into this movement who are not part of the choir to build the movement 
And you don't build a movement by starting from a position is, I hate all vaccines and all vaccines are bad. You, you have to be open. You have to, you know, I, I always start by telling audiences, I'm for vaccines, I'm never for mandatory vaccines. If there's a vaccine that is good for me and it's, you know, it has no bad side effects and it does everything that it's advertised to do, which is to uh, protect me from disease for life, I would, of course, take that vaccine. I just haven't seen it happen. Now, for many years, I've told people, and the, one of the primary tools of our opponents is to characterize us all as anti vax. The mainstream of our country and of the world believes all of the propaganda about vaccines. And so if they can convince, if oh, New York Times and CNN can convince somebody that you're anti-vax, they then have a license to shut you up and to marginalize you and to discredit you and to not listen to what you're saying. Well, I try to open up all of the um, opportunities and possibilities for people to listen to me. I've been against um, mercury in fish. I've been fighting against it for 40 years, but that doesn't make me any fish. Um, I've been fighting to get uh, pesticides out of food for many years, but that doesn't make me any food. I'm not, you know, like you say, Rashid, I'm any stupidity. I'm against bad science. I'm for good science. I'm for robust science and for honest regulators. And we don't have any of those things. And, and I'm all for good vaccines that are effective and safe if they can ever be made. The problem is nobody's ever done it yet. You know, that's a perfect explanation. And I think everybody on this panel would agree with that, Roshan and Bobby. Thank you for sharing that. Our time is drawing nigh that we're going to have to close another amazing hour. But I know, Dale, you wanted to say something, so I wanted to give you that opportunity. Well, I just want to piggyback because I think there's an easier way to, I mean, I, I agree with everything that's being said, but the truth is, is one of our biggest complaints um, from the movement that's fighting, Bobby Kennedy have won lawsuits against government agencies, NIH, Health, Health and Human Services. We're winning because we're right. But, you know, one of our biggest complaints is that they keep saying, the pro vaxxers keep saying the science is settled. And we all know, anyone that's been through a high school science class knows that's the least scientific statement you could possibly make. And that's why I don't say I'm anti-vaccine. It's the same as saying my science is settled. Nothing will ever happen in the future that could change my mind. That makes you an idiot. And that makes you unscientific. What I'm saying is the current scientific, you know, the current process of vaccinations and all the safety studies we look at that are non-existent, that this is not a product I would use. Is there a case? I'm not anti-science, I'm pro-science. And so I'm not saying the science is settled. There may be an illness so dangerous that somehow either it's a biological attack or a mutation that happens, it's possible it could be out there in our future. And there's a vaccine that's so safe and so great that I might change my mind. I leave myself open to that. That's what having a scientific mind and you know is all about, right? Is not closing doors, it's understanding what you're looking at. And to be very specific, and this is something I talk about a lot now as I'm being interviewed, I'm not against vaccination. I think it's perfectly noble to try and protect people that are in acute risk from COVID-19 right now with a vaccine. Great. Go right ahead. Here's my problem. My problem is that the vaccine should be designed for people that need it. When we look at COVID-19, 95% of the people have no issue with this illness whatsoever. They're going to have a robust immune reaction that will be far more, it'll last far longer. It will be able to handle more mutations of the virus. It is the Ferrari of immunity and a vaccine has only ever provided the Pinto of immunity. That's the best they can do. It's not their fault. So I want that long-term immunity that lasts and, and can cover many more different mutations. I don't have to go into the shop every time the thing breaks down because it lasts forever. That's where I'm at. But here's the problem. Make the product for those that need it. What we cannot allow any longer is this idea that science only knows how to, pro to make a product that all the 95% of pe healthy people can take, but not the immune suppressed, not those that are in danger. That's a, that is such an obvious 
advertising marketing scheme, you got to hand it to them. They don't want to make a treatment right now that takes care of 0.1 to 0.3% of people are dying and having an acute reaction. There's no money in that. They want the rest of us, 99.7% of us, to take a product we don't need. That's the problem with modern medicine. That's the problem with science. Go ahead, make the vaccine. You are capable. I am, I am so sure that the scientists of the world and all the funding coming from Bill Gates, you are completely capable of making a product for the tiny percentage of group of people that really do need it. Focus on them and let the rest of us alone. Let's have the Ferrari of immunity get on with our lives having a robust, you know, herd immunity that protects all those other people in the future. We are the heroes, the ones that get this common cold right now, not by sitting in your basement, you know, eating a Burger King, watching Nintendo, you know, playing Nintendo and, 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 and watching television all day. That is not going to save this country. What's going to save this country is getting out there for 95% of us, soldier up and go and get this cold and let's get on with the rest of our lives. I want to say one thing, and that is that I have publicly stated I will go anywhere on the planet, no matter how rampant the, the issue is, I will shake their hand, I will hug them, and if she's good and looking enough, I'll even kiss her. <laughs> I have no problem with, I wouldn't kiss you, though, Ty, even though you have tried to kiss me before. <laughs> I have no problem with getting that exposure, as long as you let me have my little, you know, pills and pop potions that I have, because I'm sure I might get sick, but I know that in a day or two or four days or five days, I'll be fine. It is that uh, safe that I'm willing to do that. The whole point is any vaccine, in my opinion, is going to defy human physiology based upon the history and the precedent that's been set in the past. And that's the reason I will die if somebody tries to force a vaccine on me. I have no problem taking on the COVID-19 or anything else. If I die, I die. Everybody, we all die, right? But to be forced with the vaccine? No, it's not gonna happen here. That, you know, you know, I remember that and you give me a good eulogy. <laughs> but that, that's the point of our discussion right now is um, we, we, we want to learn the truth about vaccines, the truth about COVID, what's really going on. And in a free society, we, we ought to be afforded the right to speak and to be heard, to dialogue back and forth. And there are talking points that keep people triggered from even listening to us because the term anti-vax is somewhat like the term conspiracy theorist. So there are certain things that are triggering people to tune out of what we're saying. And uh, on to add insult to injury, we can't um, convey this message in a way that people can hear easily because of the censorship is issue. So as a result, we, we work together. We've worked together for years, all of us, um, through our films and on our live event stages uh, that we've had. And we're so proud of each one of you. And we stand with you. We, we know that you are uh, modern day heroes, the Avengers. They made a movie about you guys, us, right? The, the Avengers. And uh, those are just actors. You're really doing it. We're proud of you. And so we're going to continue to work with you, each one of you. And we want to highlight what you're doing so that, that our viewers can, can tune in to what you're doing. And we need to continue to support one another and um, talk to, and I encourage all of the viewers out there to choose to own this entire series, share it with your friends. We set it up to where we literally are giving you a free copy of this um, DVD, uh, just an extra one to share with your doctor. Send it to the president of the United States. Send it to your legislators, your teachers, your pediatricians. Share this information far and wide because everybody needs to know with the, the heavy censorship, we count on you sharing this critical life-saving information with everybody you know. And with that said, I wanna go around the panel, starting with Andy Wakefield, Dr. Andy Wakefield, and, and Andy and each one of you spend about a minute just telling us what you're doing and how people can find you. And I think that most people know that, but let's start with Dr. Andy Wakefield. Thank you very much. Well, against the sort of uh, uh, events of epidemic proportions, of, of biblical proportions, like the Old Testament we faced, we faced plague and tornadoes, and we just need a pl plague of frogs. But we, the, the new film comes out uh, in a few weeks' time. We'll know precisely when in the near future. But we, um, it's called 1986: The Act, and it goes right to the core of the very problems we've been discussing. How did this come to pass? What was the catalyst that really drove this pro-vaccine vaccine agenda worldwide? and the push for mandates. And um, it was in large part the 1986 Act signed into law by Ronald Reagan, which gave 
liability protection to the vaccine makers for damage done by their vaccines. At the time, it was a limited liability. It's since become a liability for all damage done by all vaccines on the right recommended childhood schedule. And what it did was give the pharmaceutical industry the perfect business model of a mandatory market and no liability. And that was a profit machine. And that profit machine allowed them to buy the politicians, to buy the media, uh, to buy public opinion, and uh, to buy the medical profession. And that has made them extremely powerful. The point that Bobby made, someone made earlier, is that the flaw in all of this is that um, what circumvents the 1986 Act is fraud. If they can be shown to have committed fraud, they deliberately put people in harm's way. If they knew they could make vaccines safer and they chose not to and hid that fact, then they are liable. And one way of bringing this Act to its knees and forcing revision or repeal is to expose that fraud. And it's no exaggeration to say that, in my opinion, what the film reveals is premeditated first degree murder. And um, that is something that people will, will come to their screens very, very soon. And so uh, I urge people to watch it because it will, like Vaxxed, shift the paradigm considerably. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, you're, you're a Bonner Day hero. You've, you've uh, endured a lot for humanity and we do appreciate you as a, a, a very good friend and uh, a doctor. You're brilliant and as a filmmaker, we, we're just uh, so grateful to be a uh, partner with you and for all of our viewers when this is actually released, uh, we'll, we'll, more information coming. We will send you more information about Andy's upcoming film. We're, we're excited about it. And so thank you, Andy. Okay. And Dr. Judy, where can we find you and what would you like to share with the viewers? Well, we, you can find us um, promoting um, Plague of Corruption, the subtitle of our book, Plague of Corruption, which is what COVID-19 is and what the data in that book support, including the corruption in vaccine court, which uh, the act created this not, it's a kangaroo court. It's not really a court. Uh, and, and so how the vaccine is pre presumed innocent at all costs. So the subtitle of that book is called Restoring Faith in the Promise of Science. And there is promise in science and that we can show that, 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 you know, many, many, many good doctors, good scientists, and it's only the old boys corrupt network that has perpetrated this COVID-19, the, the, you know, largest fraud that, that is, the small amount that need to go and we can reorganize, shut down everything, start over again with true public health and, and true public health agencies to protect public health. And uh, we'll, we'll next be at Autism One, which this year is fabulous because it's virtual, like TTAV. Many of the people here will be there. We're going to show who's susceptible to those injuries. And, you know, you know me, I do the molecular mechanism thing, how we, how we, you know, how these vaccines are injuring, what cytokine storms they're creating and, and, and helping people. It's totally free. You can sign up on our website at plaguethebook.com and watch between, I believe it's May 20th and May 24th. So we'll all be doing that as soon as we stop today with, with similar panels on type one diabetes and, and how that develops from uh, uh, certain vaccines and things like that. So it will be fun and educated and it's totally free for people who now the most severe injured can't usually travel to uh, that meeting, which is usually in Chicago. So this year, everybody learns and, um, and hopefully like your series, uh, like Truth About Vaccines, we can educate everybody that there are safe, effective ways to educate the immune system to prevent and treat infectious disease and cancer. And Judy, one, one quick thing I'd like to uh, just touch upon, because I know that our viewers have asked and they've, they've been wanting to hear from you specifically about um, your, your history with, um, I would say, being a whistleblower. And we've talked a lot about that. And we've been communicating recently around the release of The Truth About Vaccines 2020 and um, talking about this panel and you sharing and you're out there talking about it and sharing about what has happened to you and how you said no to people that wanted you to be quiet about the truth that you found 
and um, they threatened you and you, you shared that you did not, do, you're not doing what you're doing to make money. You're doing what you're doing to help humanity. And as a result, they, they were wrecking ball in your life. You, you went to jail because you would not submit to this. And uh, you had a gag order for so many years. And the first time you spoke publicly about what exactly was going on after the gag order was lifted was at our live event. So can you walk us through that for just a minute real quick? Right, well, at your live event in 2019, but again at 2016 at that first live event, because the, the gag orders was lifted at the end of 15, meaning they couldn't recharge me and take me back to jail again, which was what was threatened and, and the extortion of if I even went on social media, um, uh, I would be jailed in this time. Um, you know, I'd never get out. And, and the example they gave was they got O.J. Simpson, didn't they? So, um, and, and he was accused of stealing his own stuff, which you know, was what I was accused of without any kind of, of charge or anything. So if they could do it the first time without a shred of evidence, um, I was, you know, essentially, even though it wasn't legally, essentially on house arrest for five years, not able to say. So I was disappointed when I was so excited to get that invitation in. 2019 thought I could heal everybody with uh, cannabis and other natural products therapies because that's what I am and when I saw the title of the talk was persecution and cover-up uh, I just I was crushed um, and I had to actually go look because some of it most of it I'd never seen and and all I did was google in science mag you know Cohen and Mike of it, sciencemag.org, and there were 23 articles showing how they targeted and paid off with grants and, and papers, um, everyone who committed this, this perpetration of this fraud, fraud against humanity with respect to the mouse cancer causing viruses. It was extremely painful. We had a case that was under seal, a key TAM whistleblower case, meaning it was under seal with the government. You couldn't say a word about it, get a lawyer or anything until they decided if they were going to take the case as a whistleblower. Five years it was under seal. They dropped it with prejudice, meaning I couldn't file it again the Monday after I gave that talk. So if you don't think they're watching and and, and, and you can show the literally libelous acts and how, how bad our scientific community is with well, not only with censorship, but with propaganda masquerading as science as they misinterpret data in order to cover up um, this plague of corruption. And you know, with the plague of corruption, when all of this went down, who was it that, that told you to, to not tell the truth? Who was that? Uh, well, it was uh, Ian Lipkin, Tony Fauci, you know, it, um, the head of the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, Simone Glenn, Michael Bush, um, Blood, Inst Blood Systems Research Institute in San Francisco, the blood supply heavily contaminated, vaccines heavily contaminated. So everybody, you know, if I simply apologize and tell everyone literally while I'm held in jail without bail and mm -hmm. uh, it, with a bail hold and no charge, fugitive from justice. Tony Fauci at the NIH can't go do the replication study in a lab. I'm a fugitive from justice. That was still there in, in, in uh, November of 2016 when I went back to Fort Detrick to get a paper out of the library for vaccine court case I was working on. Still said fugitive from justice and I couldn't get out that door and back in that car fast enough before they would have arrested me or detained me as he said again. Fortunately the cop was one of my friends played on a softball team with that I coached a number of years. Uh, the pictures are in the middle of the book and uh, he said well Judy I have to take you I have to detain you <laughs> but I have to go to the bathroom. So I'm not stupid. I got out that door. <laughs> so oh. we have our friend here and the book has a fabulous ending. In fact, how Frank Rossetti did and did in fact um, not throw away the data, not, not be, um, uh, uh, burn the data. He was forced into retirement, but he used his entire two years to make sure every bit of it got to safety. Um, to, um, never again will something like William Thompson and the data burning party happen. We've got all the data and that the, the attorney general has had it on a hard drive since 2015. 
So we know that the FBI, the Attorney General are fully complicit. They know exactly what happened and they're part and parcel to COVID-19 and this plague of corruption. Wow, well Judy, you're a, a modern day hero. We commend you for standing for the truth because too many people cower under that pressure. It's, it's a lot of pressure we know, uh, but we're proud to, to um, call you our friend and to stand with you. And um, I, I'm so excited to see you on Twitter now. You don't, I know you don't really know how to do that. So you've got the Google whistleblower and I wanna meet him too. We're so proud of him. So tell him hello and hopefully yes. we can hook up and tell him he's doing a good job on that Twitter. If you all haven't found Judy on Twitter, she, and you know, funny, the other day I was tweeting out something about vaccines and I'm like, Judy's got to see this. And I don't even know if you see it. So tell the Google guy, you know, to get a hold of us and we'll be sure he sees it and retweets. But I, I tried to tell you, Judy, and it was Dr. Judy A and I saw you. So I just hit enter and I think I tagged you and it was another Judy. So just be sure that you spell the whole thing out. It's with an A. Uh, and her handle is at Dr. Judy, D-R, Judy A and Mike Bitz, your, your last name is spelled out there. That's why I, I, said, I got the that's wrong why they came in to help us because somebody came out with a fraudulent Dr. Judy saying, I love vaccine, polio saved the world. Oh. And, and uh. oh, what do we do? And we just called up one of our friends and he said, Zach will fix it. You just have to come out with a new account. Yeah. And he just blew it out of the water with like 70,000. Well, what are you at 100,000? Like 84,000, I think the last time I saw. But what are you today? Do you know your number? I have no idea because I've never <laughs> looked at it. It's viral. I asked I asked, actually asked him and we took it back from him. So I'm going to tweet for myself, if you can believe that. I'm oh, wow. I'm, so sh I'm shook. I'm shook. I'm so shook. Well, you know, I love your bio. And so I love it so much that I had my design team create some pretty cool graphics. And people are flipping over those graphics. They're going viral everywhere on Instagram and Facebook. And, and we've sent them out in, on our um, email. And of course, you share that on your Twitter. So everybody, find her on Twitter. Support her. Thank you, Judy, so much for joining us. And the one and only Dell Big Tree. Dell, we have been friends for, for years now. We love your wife, Lee, and your children. You've been into our home. We've broken bread together. And um, you know, I ha your, your wife's book is on my coffee table. I've got two now because my first one in Pittsburgh, it got flooded. So it's, it's actually, I'm looking at it, the, the flooded one. It's a little warped, but I treasure it. We love you, Dell. Tell us, and I think that most of our viewers know you. We featured you just about in everything that we've ever done. Um, but how can our people find you and what is your main cause that you'd like to make everybody aware? Well, I, first of all, you can always find me at thehighwire.com. Of course, I'm doing a weekly talk show. I have um, my third year now. I've done over 160 episodes of The High Wire with Dell Bigtree. If you're looking on Facebook or YouTube, you've got to put the whole thing in there now because they censor any, I mean, you just don't get it handed to you. The High Wire with Dell Bigtree or go to thehighwire.com and you can find your way uh, to the episodes we've created. We predicted the fall of the imperial model nine to 10 weeks ago, uh, our data crunching. I've, I've actually hired um, scientists and researchers around the world now that are helping me uh, bring forward, um, which has been, it's been a really great time for us. The high wire is almost batting 100%. Uh, you know, we've been very successful at the things we've stated over the last several weeks, so people should check that out. Of course, my nonprofit's website is icandecide.org. If you want to read about the lawsuits and many of them that Bobby has helped me with and, uh, and the work that we've done and our vaccine safety papers are all really good information if you're just getting into this discussion on vaccines. I think I would just like to say that I really believe that this is a time of, of hope. Uh, I think that we need to look at this a different way. I think there's a lot of you know, foreboding information, but you know, I think about what President Roosevelt said, we have nothing to fear except fear itself. Uh, fear is what they're trying to sell us, more than a vaccine program, more than censorship, more than tracking, it's fear. All of this happens if we're afraid. Being afraid of those things happening is just as debilitating as being afraid of COVID-19. If you're experiencing a life of fear right now, you gotta shift that energy and start looking at everything that you have in your life and know that we are powerful. Our bodies are beating this, whether it's a man-made virus or it's a virus you know, out of Wuhan, it doesn't matter. We are amazingly designed and that goes for all parts of our life. When, you know, yes, there's censorship taking place. You know, yes, they're, you know, they're trying to take our way of rights, but the light always you know, dispels the darkness and that's what's happening. All these are the birth pangs, I believe, of that 
future that we've all dreamed about. Whether, you know, I remember growing up as a progressive liberal, this idea that we're all going to love each other and get along will be in a beautiful world in the future. You know, I don't know what the conservative version of that childhood story is, but I know that we're there, right? We're, we're on the cusp of it. These are things that had to happen. We, and we wanted them to jump ahead, right? We wanted them to make this misstep. So now it's incumbent upon everyone watching. How do we get over censorship? We get over censorship because of you. You know, the high wire has is grown 25 times. Our, our viewership's increased in eight weeks. We've gone from hundreds of thousands of views to millions of views with every form of censorship taking place on our show. The only difference is I don't get shared. YouTube doesn't put it out. Facebook doesn't give me an algorithm. It's one person sent, handing it and sharing it to the next person. Old school, the way it used to be done. And when I think about this movement and as we're growing and we complain, oh, we're censoring, can you imagine what it took for our founding fathers to give us the freedom to fight for what happened in this nation? Thomas Paine had to write letters. These guys had to write letters and hand them to people not knowing where they're going to go. You know, the soldiers, you know, coming in your house and being able to sleep in your beds, you know, from, from England. The greatest armada in the world was against us. Everyone, like, thinking I could get out of it at any moment. And we think about those founding fathers that signed their name to the Declaration of Independence and essentially said, come and get me. Come and try and take me. And that's the attitude we have to recognize is what makes this. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have YouTube. There's no algorithms that made that easy. So we shouldn't be complaining that the algorithms aren't working for us. Humanity works for us. Our drive works for us. Our heart and our understanding and our brains. Let's work together. Let's share everybody here. Everybody's information. Not one of us is bigger than the other. No one's a greater leader than someone else. We all have to do our part. It's time to come together and take back the world, take it away from these conspiracy lunatics. None of us want what this world is they want to create. So why don't we all come to an agreement together, come from a place of love and hope, and flip on the light switch. This is our time. The light will prevail. Amen, Dale. Wow. Right. But, you know, we've, we've enjoyed... Uh, everything that you've had to give to the world, working with you. I, I still fondly remember the time we were in D.C. together. And um, we, we, I think they opened up the National Press Club. We, we had a few speakers there. We went to um, Capitol Hill. We, we talked to Jason Chaffetz. That was uh, really amazing, that meeting we all had around that table. And Jason, his life was changed. I, I saw it in his face. It was amazing. And then the dinner at Trump Hotel, all of us together, it was amazing. But when you were speaking, when, and, and, and Bobby, you were there too. That was the first time actually I met you in person, Bobby. We were, and, and that's when we had that BBC reporter. Remember she came in and she yeah. was there to hit it, man. And I, I and Tony Bark was there too. And um, she did a hit piece and, and Bobby, you came out and said, you came to hit Andy Wakefield. I know what you're here for. <laughs> and you were just, you were on it. And Dell, you were on it. And um, I got the film, I got the footage and I can't find it, but Tony actually, I, I sent it to her and she shaped shifted a little bit, but I filmed each one of you as this reporter was, was um, talking to you because we knew what she was there to do. And she did come out with a hit piece and we were able to counter that with, hey, you know what? Here's what she left out. Here's the rest of the story. That was a great time. Del, your, your speech there was revolutionary as they always are. You were screaming at the, the end and I just, that was when I realized, you know, that you have a spirit that I've seen a few others because you were rocking down the house. And then Bobby, you got up there and you spoke and um, you have such power and conviction in your heart. And, and Bobby, you've become a good friend of ours, uh, but you come from a long history of uh, statesmen. Uh, President Kennedy, um, you are, you, you know, I had to take a screenshot of a, of a comment that you made the other day when somebody was asking you about the deep state and what is your take on that? Your response was, uh, it just shook my world. And in fact, Brianna, my daughter was the one that was reading those and she said, mommy, look at this, this is amazing. Isn't he amazing? Our children love you, you know? And um, so I put it on my Instagram. I think I sent you a screenshot of that. We're so proud of the man that you are, the history that you have, the Kennedy family. We, we, we just think you're doing great things. What would you like to share with our viewers? Because I believe everybody knows who you are. And I think you're on mute. You're on mute, Bobby. So. I, I want to share my gratitude to you, Charlene, to Ty, 
for your courage, all of it, and everybody on this. This is such an extraordinary group. I'm so glad I got to sit here with you guys. These people are my friends, they're my comrade at, at arms. They're people that I trust, that I, um, that I call regularly, that we talk to each other. I talk to Judy, I think, about two or three times a day, Judy, and, and Del is one of my best friends in the world. And, um, Andy and I have been out the last year raising money for his film, and I did the introduction for Judy's book, and um, Rush is not even a, um, just a friend and a fellow advocate who I have incredible respect for, but also uh, when I need a doctor, I fly all the way to South Carolina and hang out with him and get the mercury taken out of my body. And, <laughs> Anyway, I love all of these guys, and we're all in the foxhole together, and we're on the front lines. Um, and, you know, they've all helped me build Children's Health Defense. Um, and we're, you know, Children's Health Defense now is, uh, is focusing on information, the same thing that all of us do, uh, getting the information, weaponizing it, and handing it to our followers in a form that they can use it to change the pharmaceutical paradigm. And that's what we're all about. The pharmaceutical com companies have subverted our democracy. They are, you know, they're victimizing our children. They have captured the agencies that are supposed to protect um, American citizens from powerful industries. They have corrupted the political process. Uh, they have subverted the press. And uh, they have a really a complete control and now they're using this uh, pandemic, some people call it a plandemic, because it feels so much like there was a plan behind us that we saw coming, as Del pointed out for years, to tighten the noose on us and to turn America into a surveillance state where people, because they're scared of a virus, will accept these intrusions on their liberties, on their civil rights, um, to be constantly looked at, constantly surveilled uh, through all of these 5G satellites and a million antenna that are currently being put up, put up 20,000 satellites that Bill Gates and Elon Musk are putting up, all the Silicon Valley big data people who we used to think were gonna democratize our culture and they've become the instruments of total tyranny, of total control. And all of these things are now fitting together. You know, the 5G, which is going to allow them to follow us when we, when we leave our house, not even leaving our house, because, you know, their plan is to put chips in us. Um, and, you know, this is, a, we, you know, we know, we know the patents. We see the, the investments by Bill Gates in these six different chip systems, tattooed chips, subdermal biometric chips. Microsoft just, um, just patented another technology that will put not only a sensor in people, but not only a chip, but the sensors that will, uh, that will measure your brain wave, your EEG, your EEG. Um, um, your, your brain waves, your body waves, your heart rate, your adrenaline, all of these different things. And the, the system is a, a system where they will send you a duty by telephone. You can look this patent up, and I'm actually going to do a post about it tomorrow. You perform that duty, and then you will be paid in cryptocurrency. So they'll say, we want you to look at this advertisement. We want you to listen to this song. We want you to walk down this aisle at, your, at a grocery store. And when you've done that, you get a payment in cryptocurrency. And of course, all of these Americans who are terrified, who are locked in their homes, who no longer have jobs because, you know, because the, the um, self-driving cars put 50% of the people out of work. And they're turning us into all these smart devices. They're not the product. You are the product. And that's what they're turning us into. They're turning us into production units and consuming entities. And they're figuring out exactly, you know, that they can monitor us all the time, collect our data. 5G is not about bringing you more quicker downloads for your video games or for your movies. It's about surveillance and control. It's about 
it, it's about taking all the data from your devices, from your Apple Watch, on the Alexis in your home that is eavesdropping on you all day, from the Siri that is eavesdropping on you, from your microwave oven, from your digital garage door opener, and, and from your PayPal, and from your Venmo, so that they know what you're doing, what you're buying, everything about you, and that data is the new oil rush of the 21st century, the gold rush. Data is the biggest value entity now on Earth. And these companies are going to be harvesting how you feel, what you do, what's going on in your body. Gates has a chip that will turn on and off your uh, a woman's um, uh, uh, menstrual process so that she can and cannot have babies. It will administer drugs inside of your body for years, thousands of doses. And every part of our lives is now going to be subject to control. And this you know, this disease is about, as, as Dell said, it's about engineering compliance. It's about training us to do what we're told, to not go to the beach unless we're told, to not kiss our girlfriend unless we're given permission. Mm -hmm. The other day in Malibu, police were out on the beach giving $1,000 tickets to surfers for using the ocean. And people are putting up with this. And when they get this system, 5G system in place, you won't even see that because they'll know when you were at the beach by looking at your cell phone, by looking at your GPS, by tracing you by your chips, and they'll just withdraw $1,000 from your payroll account with cryptocurrency. They're trying to get rid of all the money. That's one of Gates's major things, to get rid of the cash economy. That way they can monitor and scrutinize every transaction that you make and if they don't like you if you just leave them they can shut it all off and we need to understand that that is what's happening here they are going to rob us not only of our democracy and our liberties but they're going to rob us of our souls and they're going to inject us with the medicines that they want and they're going to charge us for the diseases that they give us they're going to control our populations they're going to control our movement they're going to control every part of our lives Oh, if you are not part of this battle and you are lost, we are the only things that are left for all of the things that we value in our lives, all of the things that our country stood for. This is it. And what we're doing, you know, at CHD is we're suing them. We're losing, using the last instruments of our democracy that are left. We're end running, we're running the blockade of censorship like Dell and with all of our, my friends here, and we're litigating against them. We're suing Merck, for the HPV vaccine. We are already in discovery. We are in their wheelhouse. We are looking at their internal pay, papers and they are terrified. We're filing more lawsuits on the censorship. I'm not gonna give you a spoiler on that. I'm gonna tell you that that's coming within a month again, some of the major platforms for censoring us. And we are, we are suing to protect doctors who are being harassed and intimidated in California, to protect families who are being abused in New York. We're litigating all over the country because the courts are one of the few places that are left where we can still make a difference, where we can still change policy. They've, they've, they've neutralized and co-opted and infiltrated all of the other institutions of our democracy that are supposed to stand between a vulnerable little child and a greedy corporation, they're gone. And it is us today that are standing between them. And we have a very, very important job, which is to inform our public, to organize our public, to strategize with each other, which we do. And I'm so grateful that the people that I'm working with are people that who are all on this, you know, all of the major leader, the leaders here, Sherry, I don't see Sherry anymore, but Sherry and all of those who are, of you who are here are people that I respect, that I love, that are my brothers, my sisters. And um, I'm so glad that all of you guys are in the foxhole with me. And, um, you know, we, we are in the last battle. This is the apocalypse. We are fighting for the salvation of humanity. And, you know, we all knew this was coming at some point. But I never believed it would come in my lifetime.
but here it is. And now, you know, we're lucky. We are the few, the happy few, the band of brothers and sisters. We know what our job is in this life. We know that we're part of this battle, that we have to fight, and that we have to die with our boots on if necessary. And we all, everybody here, I'm confident, knows what their duty is and is going to do that duty and I'm going to be beside you when you do it and I know all of you are going to be standing beside me. Thank you Ty, thank you Charlene and let's keep fighting. Wow, that, thank you Bobby. We, we sure do love you and uh, you, you're beyond inspiring. You're, you're not just talking about it, you are doing it and you're making it happen and children's health defense is something we're proud to um, contribute to and to stand uh, with you. Your team is tremendous. Uh, Laura Bono, Lynn, Lauren, all of the people that work with you behind the scenes, um, they're working night and day. And, and we love you all, Bobby. Bobby, you're a special man. And uh, we are so grateful that you're using this amazing platform, the Kennedy name, your name, who you are, your, your heritage to save the world. We stand with you. We're proud to do so. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bobby. <clears throat> Yes, and Dr. I, I, have, I have a four o'clock and I have to leave. People are screaming at me right now. So. Bobby, over and out. We love you. Thank you, Thank you Bobby. My friends, <laughs> Rashid, call me if you're done, okay? I will. All right. And Sherry, Dr. Sherry Timpenny, share with us um, what you would like to. Uh, our viewers to know we've we've also worked with you for years and you've been on our live event stages and our uh, viewers love you as we love you sherry you're doing great and important work i've had fun i'm uh, finding you on telegram going back and forth uh, you know I, I, there there was a little pickle we ran into the other night and sherry you're awesome she she run you know she pulled me back in and helping me with uh, <laughs> whoa, yeah, she's like, whoa, chill, whoa, chill whoa. There, so i appreciate that i, I i'm thankful for you and as is ty so what would you like to share? What are you doing and what do our viewers need to know? Well, a couple things that I'm doing, but I, after listening to what Bobby had to say, I mean, I, one of the things I've done just a ton of interviews and talks just like Rashid has over the last month, it's just, it's, and some of them have been like this very long and some of them have been little drive-by, you know, things, but there've been lots. And one of the things that I've said that I, I really believe is that, you know, when you look at this whole situation and this whole shutdown, you know, Maybe, maybe God put the entire world on full stop for right now so that, and we can take advantages of that time. And, you know, maybe every one of us could say, gee, you know, if I only had the time, I would, and then fill in the blank. Hmm. Well, guess what? You've got some time now. <laughs> so maybe that means like clean out a closet, clean out your garage, get rid of all that old expired food and junky stuff you shouldn't be eating in your cupboard. You know, get into your genealogy. Tell your kids stories about when you were growing up or your grandparents that may not even be alive anymore. Um, get it, learn how to knit, crochet, can, do preserves, you know, different things. Do that thousand piece jigsaw puzzle you always wanted to do with the, with the whole family. Do some things now in your physical house to get your physical house in shape that you've always wanted to do that you've never really had the time to do before. And so now is maybe the time to do it because you're in your house. So like get your physical house in order, you know? The second thing I've, it, you should do is get your physical body in order, the place that you actually live. You know, now's the time, you know, you don't have to get up at seven o'clock in the morning to go to work. So you might as well get some sleep, you know, get some extra sleep, maybe get some extra exercise, drink some extra water, read some of those big stacks of books that you've got all sitting around that you've always been, always wanted to have the time to read, you know, the, the inspirational books or medical books or history books or whatever, you know, your, your topic is. Take the dog for a walk, you know, spend time with your physical body, get the, the exercise that you need, but primarily get some sleep. I mean, we're all sleep deprived. We all worked way too many hours. Eat better, learn how to cook, do some different things with types of, of you've got some time now. So everybody's got spare cookbooks up in the cupboard. So do some different things that learn to eat different foods and bring some things into your physical body that you just really haven't had time for now. And thirdly, and most importantly, get your spiritual house in order. I mean, you know, we've got some pretty big battles coming up and we can be as optimistic or as pessimistic as we want to be about what we think the next three to six years is. Most of us that are Christians kind of know what the end game is. I mean, we kind of know what's, what that, what, we know what the end of the story is. And in between now and then, whether it's a six months, six years, 16 years, however long it is, get your spiritual house in order. I mean, God puts you on full stop 
so that you can get your spiritual house in order, what that means to you. I mean, how does that really resonate with you? You know, if you've t never taken the time to pray, you just haven't had time to do it, well, now you got the time. So to me, this is sort of like one of those aspects of taking the lemons of worrying about your job, worrying about your money, your kids being home from school, having to spend all day in the same room with your spouse that you're just not used to doing. I mean, just all of those things. To me, those are three areas of taking lemons, the lemon of this thing, the, the fear factor, the scary things, the stuff we talk about, about the, the vaccine, possible mandatory vaccines, all the stuff that we just talked about in the last couple of hours. But what elements of that can we take that are lemons and make some lemonade? And so I think your physical house in order, your body house in order, your spiritual house in order is, is sort of like the message that I kind of go forward with with people. And I think it kind of resonates. And so if people want to find out more about me personally, if, you, if you're kind of new to this and you don't really know me personally, um, you can go to drtenpenny.com, which is D-R-Tenpenny, my last name, .com, which is just kind of a brochure, a brochure wear site that they call it that we put up there that's got pictures of speaking and my CV. And if you want to ask me to speak on your radio show or your podcast or something, that's the way you can contact us. And Vaxter.com, V-A-X-X-T-E-R, that's where we do our new site, where you can also sign up for our newsletter. And our Instagram account is just blowing up. That's um, Dr. Tenpenny. And Busy Dr. T is our Twitter account. And so we've made a big effort. My team has made a pretty big effort. Just, we've just been working together now for about the last five months to really kind of launch this up to get our message out there. And it's a, um, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and more than 40,000 hours. And, and I'm, a, you know, one of the physicians on the team that have been able to stand up and say, not only no, but hell no, we're not doing this. And so, and you need to be able to know what the science is. And and I suppose that, you know, there's just a few of us physicians at the top that are really kind of doing it. So, and everybody that's here, I mean, Andy, you've been a friend of mine like forever. I mean, you've been an inspiration since 2000. When I first started, got into this and you were one of the first people I met. And so it's just been a pleasure to know, to know, get to know Dell better. Rashid, you and I have been friends since like 2004 and getting to know, Bob, we had some great stories to tell about that. And, um, you know, just uh, Ty and Charlene, ever since you started doing the truth about vaccines and the sun's starting to set, it's coming right in my window over here, um, is, um, you know, I'm so grateful for everything that you've done and given us an opportunity and given us a platform. And Dell, you've given us a platform. You know, that if it wouldn't be for the stuff you do with Highwire and, and the different things, I mean, who would hear us? There would be this small little place. So, you know, Bobby's launched all this stuff in the vaccine or in the legal world and you have too, and, but you've given us a platform. You've given us a voice to get our messages out. And so it's like, I just have to echo a little bit with what Bobby said about, it's just great to know that there's teammates that you can pick, we, any of us can pick up the phone or, or message or text each other at any given time and either give a word of support or somebody, Bobby calls me and say, hey, I need an article on something, you know, you know, just little things that we can like share with each other. And like what Dell said, you know, cross pollinating, letting each other know that because the general community doesn't know that we all know each other and we all work together. I mean, I still get, I got to turn this a little bit. I get, I get emails or text messages of things like, have you ever heard of Dell Big Tree? <laughs> you know, yes, I think so. Um, and, or I'll get a, a message that'll say something like, do you know who Barbara Lowe Fisher is? I mean, so I think there's an element of the general people because there's always new people coming into our movement all the time. People who've suddenly grown up, got married and starting to have kids, they're suddenly in our wheelhouse. They really don't know that we all know each other and that there's, there's a pretty small team of people at the, at kind of at the top of this, of this pyramid, if you want to call it that. Sorry about the light, guys. This is the way it is. Let me put this up over here. And so, um, so anyways, I just think that it's really kind of important for us to let everybody know that we all know each other. We work together. It just makes our team look bigger. So thank you for the opportunity. And I'm going to go with the sunlight like shining in my face over here. Maybe it's like suddenly, suddenly, and then there was light, right? And so the, there was light on the whole, angel, on the whole thing. Light, it's, it's like angel things shot. coming in here. So yeah. thanks, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to be part of this. Um, and I love, you, love all you guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sherry. Sherry. Yeah, Sherry, we love you too. And um, we're just so grateful to, to be working along your side. And you're right. Um, we are united in this. This is a, a fight for the right thing. We're fighting for life. We're fighting for truth and uh, the hearts and minds to be able to understand and know the truth. And we are in this together. We are working together. That's why when we make our films, you're all in them. And when we have you on stage, you're all on that stage together. And when we have parties, we all get together and we do communicate. That's something that we really want 
everyone out there to understand we're all in the same team. And you know, it's not about right versus left, Democrat versus Republican. It's about right versus wrong. And we're here to do the right thing and to reach the world for life. Sherry, you do that every single day. We love working with you. Thank you Thank so you. much for being a part of this special time with us. Thanks, Sherry. And that, that's yeah. it, folks. Uh, we, no one <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rashi. I got to go to the bathroom anyway. <laughs> Rashi, you're up, baby. Our buddy, the doc. Yeah. Dr. Buttar. We love you. Can I just say yeah, things? Yeah, say nice some nice things. Thing. I, I don't mean, have I'm... anything nice to say. You can say. You can say. Okay, so, so even though they won't admit it, I can tell you that they do love each other. They're good friends. They joke around a lot. That's just the way they are. I mean, they're like almost best friends. So um, it's, it's pretty cool. You're and like the brother I never wanted to have. <laughs> and, um, anyways, I, I, I want to beat the crap out of you each time I see you. <laughs> I think I talk to Rasha more than you do. I'm, I, we've been texting every day. Um, we're really proud of you, Doc. You're out there in the front lines. You, you have... Um, I am proud to say that your videos, and they deserve to go viral, all of your videos deserve to go viral. Right now, Rashid, your videos are like hitting the millions of views. You had like two people on YouTube a couple weeks ago. Now you're at like, what, 300,000, 200,000? I mean, we're getting close to a million. I, I see a million in the air. Your, your, your videos have millions of views. And um, you're on Instagram and Sherry, I've noticed your Instagram blowing up. I see it, it's growing by leaps and bounds all the time. It's awesome. I love to see these numbers growing. We need to cross pollinate, cross promote. We want everyone to find Sherry Tenpenny. She's on uh, Instagram, got great stuff going on there. But Rasha, you've got, you're on Instagram, you're on um, YouTube. I think you're on Twitter. Yeah, I've seen you on Twitter a lot, but your numbers are growing. And, and I know the reason they're growing is because you're resonating. People want the truth and you're telling the truth. You're talking about stuff that nobody else is talking about. And, and we're being censored because somebody or somebody's, they don't want us to, to reach the people with these truths. So um, share with us, Rashid, what you're doing and your different channels and, and something that are uh, some things, a bunch of things that you want our viewers to know so they can find you and find the help that you're offering. Well, thank you for that, Charlene. So I'll try to keep it really brief. Uh, before I do that, Charlene, I just wanna say something about fear because Dell, you opened up that can of worms and I just wanna to touch this. Fear is an illusion. It exists only in our mind. And this is one of the places where they're trying to take humanity down is from this fear aspect. And fear is, is, is not real. Danger is real, but fear is not. And so when I'm talking about fear and danger, I want you to be aware that danger is real and you need to be cognizant of it. But what they are painting right now is that this COVID-19, the coronavirus is the danger and they're trying to make you fearful of it. Whereas in fact, the danger is not the coronavirus. The danger is exactly what Bobby talked about, what Dell talked about, what a Andy talked about at, the, at uh, TTAC back in 2019 and that I piggybacked on what you'd said, Andy. That's what we need to be concerned about because that's the danger, taking away our rights, taking away our fundamental autonomy over our own bodies, over our own children. And it is truly, this is not an exaggeration what Bobby's saying, it is a fight for humanity. People have given me all sorts of accolades and said, I'm so brave, I'm so this and that. They don't seem to understand. Has, if, if I don't fight and if the rest of us don't fight, my children will not have children. And that's what motivates me. My life, I've already, if I die today, I've lived a wonderful life. I've lived three wonderful lives. The creator has truly blessed me, but I want to make sure that my children have the same opportunity and the mankind, the humanity has a possibility of a future. And I am so excited right now to be alive because I believe that we are writing history here and we will be remembered. Kids, grandkids, our great grandkids will say, my grandmother, my grandfather was involved with that battle when humanity always almost became extinct. So I'm excited. I can, I'm resonating in that frequency, Dell. I, I, I know that of everybody that I know, you're one of the few people that has that fire and just can't keep it back and almost like verbally vomit on people. You do it a lot more eloquently than I do, but I appreciate everybody's energy. As far as um, what, how people can reach us, I had a conversation with Ty at about 2.30 in the morning, my time, and I had a strategy. I pitched to him and he, after watching the, one of the videos, called me back and said, yeah, that's what you need to do. So we're announcing that all those videos that we put together, um, the, there's part six has been dry, um, part six, which is being aired right now, in fact, 
on multiple episodes. Once that's done, it'll be put on advanced medicine and all of those things are free. But basically, if you go to ask Dr. Buttar, A-S-K-D-R-B-U-T-T-A-R.com forward slash T-T-A-V for the truth about vaccines. If you go there and follow the cascade, just follow the links, you will get to the part where you can access the dashboard and you'll be able to see all these videos and you can download them. My strategy with Ty after talking with Nia Peoples was we give them to everybody. That's not going to cost you a single dime. Get it to everybody, put it in your hands, put it in your smart devices, put it in your phones because they can't censor. They may be able to censor from YouTube and Facebook, but they can't censor from your own devices. And then pay it forward, pass it on, because the most important thing we can do is empower people with knowledge. Because once you've been empowered, nobody can victimize you. And then it doesn't make any difference what they try to do, because now you know what the facts are, you know where the real danger is, and you won't be fearful anymore. Wow, that was a great um, summation and presentation. Good advice. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for getting the, the truth out into the world and making it available um, so simply and easily. We want to thank each one of you for being here and um, sharing your knowledge and your platforms. Uh, we thank you for always working with us. And we're going to continue to work with you and shine a light on the important things that you're doing every single day. And to the viewer, thank you for joining us. This has been Ty and Charlie Bolliger with The Truth About Vaccines. This wraps up our The Truth About Vaccines panel. The, vac the Vaccine round table. Round table. Yes, yeah. Yes. yeah, we appreciate everybody watching The Truth About Vaccines and all the episodes, the two extra round tables that you've seen this yesterday and today and um, just all the support. So thank you so much. Thank you to all the experts on the round table. And uh, we just hope everybody has a great day. God bless all of you out there. And um, let's keep fighting for health freedom because that's what we all want is just our own health freedom. The ability to say yes or no to what goes in our own bodies. Absolutely. And you know that the Bible says in Hosea 8, uh, 4, 12, that my people perish for lack of knowledge. We're here to give you the truth. And in John uh, chapter 8, verse 32, it says, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You are free today. Indeed, we have given you the truth. Share it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. God bless. God bless.